So we'll do for you guys today. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out this morning to hear Dr. Fong speak. Uh, Dr. Andrew Fong is an orthopedic spine surgeon with Austin Sports Medicine. He's going to touch on some things about back pain and hopefully give you guys some information so you guys can be equipped to know what to expect and how to treat it. Um, so no further ado, the man himself, Dr. Andrew Fong. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Shana, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Great House Library, for allowing me the opportunity to come here and talk. And thank you so much for joining me on this dreary morning. So, um, you know, today, like Shana said, we're going to talk about is this is this better for y'all? Um, we're going to talk today about low back pain. And so, Spine surgery and spine training is a long and arduous process, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to summarize all of it in about an hour. And so we'll do our best, and at the end, there will be plenty of time for questions. So if you have any questions as we go through, just kind of remember them, and I'm happy to answer them and in either in front of everyone or just we'll be standing around afterwards, too. Okay. Um, but a quick introduction about me like Sean said, I work at Austin Sports Medicine, where I'm a city practice. Um, I was trained in orthopedic surgery. I specialized in spine surgery. Previously to living here in Austin, Texas, I practiced in Washington, D.C. for a few years, but I grew up in Texas. So I did my med school um, in Galveston. I did college at Baylor. Um, ended up doing my orthopedic residency in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and then did my fellowship up in Austin, Massachusetts. So today, our objectives or goals for the talk. We're going to first kind of give a framework for how to understand the spine and review the anatomy. Um, after that, we'll be able to talk about the, the causes of back pain and uh, other issues with the spine, and then we'll discuss the traditional and non-traditional treatment options, and then describe surgical treatments for traditional classic surgical treatment options and newer treatments that are on the horizon. So, you have low back pain, you're not alone. 80% of adults experience low back pain at some point in their lifetime. So it is probably the fifth most common reason why people come to their physicians and doctors is to talk about low back pain. Nearly 65 million Americans are currently reported that they've had some kind of recent episode of back pain, and 80 million will probably say they suffer from chronic back pain issues. So this makes up a significant amount of the population. So if you do have back pain, just know that you are not alone in this. The good news with back pain is that 95% of the time, you won't need surgery. So studies have come out evaluating people with back pain complaints, and they found that 90 to 95% of the time, there was not any sort of serious structural abnormality going on. It's probably not going to need surgery. So more likely than not, if you have back pain, it's not going to be something that requires invasive interventions is likely to respond to conservative treatment, which is what we'll talk about. More about back pain is the sixth most costly condition in the United States, resulting in a uh, cost of almost $216 billion per year. Uh, and then over time, we just expect that back pain will be more and more common. Not only is this secondary to the aging population, but also because of our lifestyles change. It's, it's not healthy for our backs. It's going to be more sitting, stooping over, looking at our phones, um, and not keeping up with some of the healing exercises. Why is back pain so difficult to treat? You know, if you know people that have back issues, it seems to be a very complicated thing, and they're bouncing back and forth between many different positions, getting different pieces of advice, and being told that they have different problems. Back pain is incredibly difficult to treat, number one, because there can be so many causes for the back pain. And we'll talk about all of that later on, but back pain can come from muscle, joints, nerves, stress, posture. There's a lot of different causes of back pain, so that's the first difficulty. The second difficulty is that we just don't simply understand back pain all that well yet. But because of all the potential causes, we are not sure exactly how they all interact with one another to cause some of the different symptoms that they have. 
Uh, the other reason why is because there are different experiences between practitioners, um, even regionally. If you go to you know Boston, the causes for back pain there may be different from the causes of back pain in the south. You know, um, it could be related more towards being outside more here, whereas up in North East, it might be more because they're sitting at the desks more often. So there are regional differences. There are personal differences between people. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go into back pain and experience back pain. And that's why it's so hard to treat everyone the same way every time. So understanding low back pain, we need to start with kind of understanding the anatomy. So looking at the spine, the spine consists of seven cervical vertebrae, that's your neck, 12 brass vertebrae, which is your mid back and your ribs, five lumbar vertebrae, which is your low back, five sacral vertebrae, which is your sacral, which consists of five huge individual vertebrae, and then your toxics is your tailbone. Today, we are really just interested in the lower part of the spine. So this is what we consider the lower back. So the lumbar spine, the sacral, and the toxics. This is nothing that anyone has to memorize. Gosh, I have not. But uh, this is just to show everyone that the muscular anatomy of the spine is incredibly complex. I always tell people that when it comes to the muscles of the spine, they run very wide, they run very deep, and they run very long. So any sort of aberrations or issues that you have with any of these muscles at any point can cause back pain. So just something to keep in mind um, as we kind of talk about the causes of low back pain. Looking at the bony anatomy, I'm sorry, this keeps going in and out of my mouth. So um, this right here is what we call the vertebral body. So this is the block in the spine right here that everybody kind of sees right here on the side. Here, this is an area on the back of the spine we call the lamina, which is basically the root of the spine, is what I call it. Here, this is a spinous process. This is the attack inside of some ligaments. This is a transverse process where some muscles stem off from. This is an area called the pedicle, which is a channel bone that connects the front part of the spine to the back part of the spine. This here is the disc over here. And so the outer layer of the disc is called the annulus, and the inner layer is called the nucleus. I often say that your discs, which are these right here that sit in between the bones, they're like your shock absorbers in the spine, and they're built like jelly donuts. And so the nucleus is sort of the jelly of the donut, and the annulus is sort of the outer layer of the donut. And that's going to come into play as we talk about things like disc herniations later on. But uh, again, you have your bones and your disc right here along the front, and then you have more bone here at the back. Looking here from the, the back part of the spine here, this is a little kick from the back. This right here is what we call the set joint. So when we move, this is where the bones actually move along each other in the spine. And so just like in your knees and your hips, you can have arthritis and degenerative changes of those joints. You can also experience degenerative changes in arthritis of the facet joints, which will be another potential cause of that. So when I break down the spine, I like to break it down to a three-column structure. You have the front of the spine, okay? So this is your front column, which consists of, again, those vertebral bodies and discs. You've got the back part of your spine, the back column, which consists of the spinous problem, lamina, and your joints. And then sandwiched in between those areas are going to be your nerves. So your nerves run through this space and through this canal. Okay? So the nerves in your spine, we were just talking about how they kind of run through the in between all of this bone here. As your nerves course down from your spine, you have your brain, which gives off the spinal cord, which your spinal cord is the main nerve that comes off your brain and it's kind of the conductor of your body. So it tells your arms and legs where they should go. Branching off from the spinal cord are what we call nerve roots. So at each level of the spine, the nerve roots branch off and go to specific areas in your arms and legs. When we're talking about the lumbar spine now here, the spinal cord has actually ended. So any issues that you have with the lumbar spine typically is not going to cause anything like getting paralyzed or losing control completely of your arms and legs as the spinal cord has already ended. So you may have some issues with the nerve roots, but not the spinal cord itself. This right here is a map that kind of shows where these specific nerve roots go to in your body. And so when we look at 
a person who has complaints or pain in specific distribution, we can oftentimes use those symptoms to trace up to their back where their pain is going based off of what area of injury. So if you have pain that sits along the anterior thigh here, that correlates usually with the L3 nerve root. So that's the lumbar 3 nerve root. And so we can look on your imaging and through your MRIs to see if there's anything wrong at that area and kind of correlate it with the symptoms. Additionally, in terms in additionally, the muscles of these nerves are responsible for specific actions in your legs. And so we can actually look at someone's strength and weakness and also be able to determine what level the spine or tops come from based off of what muscle is weak. That's also not something you have to memorize. When we put it all together, this is what we get. So this is the front of your body. This is the back of your body. So here's your disc. This back here is the spinous process. The lamina is right there. This is the facet joint. Your pedicles in here. And then these yellow structures, these are your nerves. So the nerves, again, centrally, you just kind of have the bundle of all the nerves sitting in a pouch. And then these are the nerve roots that branch off and go down to your legs. When we look at it on the side view, again, this is the front. So bone, this, bone, this, more bone back here. And then this right here is the space where the nerve root is coming out of to go down to your legs. And that hole there is what we call the brain. Okay. So that's the anatomy. So any sort of deformity or injury to any of that stuff we talked about, the muscle, the bone, the joints, the discs, the nerves, that can cause pain in your back or your leg. And, and that's kind of where the root of all that we do deal with comes from. There are also other reasons for having back pain and leg pain as well. You have to look into vascular issues such as abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, kidney stones. You can have back pain because of inflammatory disorder disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis uh, or general conditions like that. Um, gynecologic issues, fibromyalgia, uh, and then arthritis of the other extremities can also cause pain to go down your legs. So obviously other causes of hip and knee pain can just be hip and knee pain. So when someone's coming to my office and they're complaining of back pain, again, we talked about how there are so many different ways that people can present. Um, you can present either with what we call acute pain, which is something less than four weeks, subacute pain, which is anywhere between four to 12 weeks, or chronic pain, which is more than three months. You know, the pain can be described as either being constant, or they could say that it's just every now and then, just when they're bending over or when they twist a certain way. So they can present in either, in either way. The pain can sometimes be described as just an ache. Sometimes people describe an electric shooting, electric shooting pain. Sometimes it's a burning pain. Sometimes people will say that they can't walk because of pain. Uh, it can be localized to the back or it can go down the legs. And we'll talk more about that later. But when the pain radiates down the leg, that usually indicates that somewhere a nerve is getting pinched or squeezed. And so we call that radiculopathy. So radiculopathy, that's radiating pain down the legs, stemming from a nerve issue that comes from the back. Some people will call that sciatica. Sciatica is more of a general term that just means pain going down the legs. Sometimes that could be sciatica coming from the back. Sometimes that could be coming from a pinched nerve around the hip. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly non-descript thing, but it describes pain going down the legs. Another way that back issues can present is just with increased endurance. So this is not something that can be underestimated. So people will sometimes come and say that they just can't walk as much as they used to and they may have to rest more. And they really don't know why. And a lot of times that's just stemming from you have core and back weakness. So talking specifically about pain that just stays in the back, which makes up the vast majority of what I see, most of the time it's just caused by muscle related issues. As we kind of pointed out on that earlier picture with the muscles, we saw how much of your, your body surface area is covered by muscles, especially when it comes to the back. And so any issues along any of those muscles can cause back pain. So the most common reason why people come and see me because of back pain is usually actually because of muscle issues. Other causes of back pain can be again be degeneration of the discs or the facet joints. 
Um, you can have abnormal motion or instability in the spine. So there's a word here called spondylolisthesis. Spondylo means spine, and thesis means slip. So sometimes you can develop a position or an issue where as the joints in your back degenerate and wear down, the spine is allowed to move and shift around a bit more than usual. So that abnormal motion can actually cause back pain as the joints are becoming irritated and also the disc is becoming irritated because your spine is moving in ways that it normally doesn't move. Other causes of back pain are, again, um, we did not talk about the SI joint because I can do an entire other talk on just the SI joint, but there is a joint there called the SI joint, which is where your spine and your pelvis meet, and you can sometimes have pain related to that area. And then also, if you have any sort of fractures, that will obviously hurt. And then scoliosis, if it reaches a certain degree, which is scoliosis is an abnormal curvature of the spine, that can sometimes cause back pain as well. Another word that people oftentimes hear whenever they talk about back pain is the word spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis is a, a general word that means you have less space around something. So you can have stenosis in other areas of your body, but when we specifically refer to spinal stenosis, what that means is you have decreased space in the spine for your nerves. And so spinal stenosis can involve either the central couch where the nerves come out of or where that where the nerves are sitting in, or they could be in the brain in here where the nerves exit out of. So you can have stenosis in multiple different areas, but they all generally mean the same thing, which is that the nerves do not have a lot of space. And so whenever you have less space for your nerves, they can get compressed, and that can cause again that radiculopathy that we described earlier. Okay. Um, so the causes of spinal stenosis are also varied. As the spine degenerates and changes shape, you can reduce the space around your nerves. Um, as when you have disc bulges or disc herniations, which are alterations to the anatomy of the disc, that can pinch on the nerves. If you have that spondylolisthesis we were just talking about, where the spine was moving more than it normally should, that can sometimes take the nerves and cause the leg pain. And then obviously fractures, which also cause abnormal motion, autoimmunity, altered tumors, infection. And then there are general abnormalities and defects that you can also have where your anatomy is not quote unquote normal, and that can also cause pressure on the nerves. So, another thing that we commonly see in addition to muscle strains, but we see disc herniations as well. So, disc herniations, we described earlier that the discs are built like jelly donuts. And so, what a disc herniation is, is when the jelly leaks out of the donut, it gets pushed out of the donut. And then what sits behind that donut are your nerves. And so again, we're dealing with radiculopathy or leg pain here because the nerves are getting squeezed and compressed. So here is a sort of a, a picture of what things normally look like. Right here, that's gonna be your jelly, that's gonna be the outer layer of the donut, and then these are your nerves back here. So when you have a disc herniation, as you can see, the jelly leaks out of the donut and it's now pushing on that nerve. So when you have something like this, again, because that nerve is being pushed on, you're probably going to have a leg pain. Now, the good news about herniated discs is that 85% of the time, these will get better on their own. The jelly does get absorbed by your body most of the time. And so most people that have this herniation, they don't need surgery, they don't need injections, they don't need any major treatment, they can find so um, that jelly doesn't go back inside the donut, and the donut doesn't make any more jelly. But you don't need all the jelly for a jelly-filled donut to still be good. And so same thing with the disc. You don't need all the other contents of this disc for that disc to still work just fine. But that's a disc herniation. So what are the risk factors for back pain? Obviously, um, age, as we've talked about a lot of sort of degenerative changes contributing to the alterations in the spinal anatomy, age is a big risk factor for the development of back pain, pregnancy, other medical comorbidities such as diabetes, osteoporosis, and generalized osteoarthritis. Um, mental health factors, there have been studies that show anxiety and depression have been associated with an increased risk of back pain. Along with that, also stress has been seen to be a, a significant risk factor in experience of pain. Um, weight gain and obesity is a risk factor. Um, 
what your job is or what you do on a daily basis. Uh, if you're doing things, obviously, with poor ergonomics, then that obviously puts you at a higher risk of developing back pain. Um, smoking has been shown also to be a significant risk factor. So if you uh, don't smoke now, then I would not start. <laughs> Whenever someone comes and talks to me about back pain, what I'm looking for specifically is kind of everything we're talking about now. I, I want to know where the pain is. I want to know, you know, where did it start? Was there a start? Uh, how did they describe their pain? What makes them feel better or worse? Uh, is it associated with any leg pain? Again, if, if, if they come with back pain and leg pain, I'm thinking more that something might be happening inside the spine itself and the anatomy is altered and pushing on the nerves. So these associated symptoms are very important. Um, I want to know what they've done before it and what other factors in their life do they, are they very active and uh, have they stopped being active recently, which kind of tells me that, oh, you know, maybe they have a deep condition that they just need to do more exercise to get them back to their social routine. Or the opposite, are they overdoing it? You know, have they recently started running 10 miles and they used to run two miles? Um, these are all things that we need to know when we talk to our patients. Uh, on the physical exam, I assess people's range of motion, how they walk. Um, I look for any tenderness on exam. Um, importantly for me, again, in, in assessing someone's anatomy, I want to make sure that their neurovascular exam is normal. So I test nerve strength, look for any numbness or weakness. Um, and then there are provocative maneuvers where we can stress certain areas of the spine to see if that bothers people as well. So the role of imaging in back pain is very important as well. Um, everyone that comes in to see me, see me, I usually start by getting an x-ray so we can get a good idea as to what the baseline is in terms of the positioning, the posture, the amount of degeneration in the spine. And so that's where x-rays can be very handy. X-rays are also good at determining or helping us figure out if someone has that spondylolisthesis or that instability so we can look for abnormal motion in the spine. Um, once we kind of done, done, done x-rays and if we need further information, we can get CT scans, which tell us a lot more bony detail in 3D. Um, and then MRIs, which MRIs tell us a lot about the soft tissue. So on an MRI, it's an example of what an MRI looks like. You can see in great detail the bone, the disc, the nerves are sitting back here in the consul fluid, which is white. Um, and so here on this cross section view, what I'm looking at here are these little black dots in there with your nerves. That's the pouch of fluid that sits in centrally. And then here, this is the foramen where the nerves are exiting out of to go down to the legs. Your disc is up here. This is kind of the back of your back of you. So this is uh, the muscles uh, front of you, the up here. Okay. So, so this is what we look at with an MRI. Um, and then a CT scan and x-rays, these both use radiation to look at you. An MRI uses a big magnet, so there's no radiation with the MRI. But in general, um, when we kind of you know summarize all of this, a CT scan allows us to look at bones in good detail, and MRIs allows us to look at MRI, uh, soft tissue in a lot of detail. So getting to our treatment options, um, non-surgically, this is you know where everyone starts. Um, traditional conservative treatment options include. You know, before you even come and see me, it should be, you know, modifying the activities. So the simplest doctor advice is if it hurts, don't do it. And so that's kind of where most people start. Um, they all people also try E and I medications such as Advil or Lee, Tylenol. And then usually once people have exhausted that, they come and see me. And from there, I'm usually sending people for physical therapy, um, strengthening exercises, flexibility. Um, and then if all of this does not work, then we do injections. So starting with the medications, typically we start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. The most common examples of these are Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen. So these are all also products. These guys Celebrex, Dicolfinac, Lox, Cam, Lovink, those tend to be prescription anti-inflammatories. But they're all in the same family. And so anti-inflammatories work to reduce inflammation. And, and so this is kind of pertaining into another talk, but inflammation is your body's sort of natural healing process. So whenever your body senses that something is wrong, 
your body will send cells there to that area to try to fix that problem. So um, these cells will go to that area, start releasing chemicals to, to help along processes to heal you. But in the process, those chemicals also stimulate a cascade of other reactions that cause pain, swelling, redness, and that is what inflammation is. Inflammation is the pain, the redness, the swelling that comes with your body naturally trying to heal itself. So what these anti-inflammatory medications do is they try to quiet down those reactions that cause the pain, the swelling, and the inflammation. So those are the anti-inflammatories we do. Other medications we do are muscle relaxers. So these are medications like Flexeril, Cyclobenzaprine, Methacarbol, Rodaxin, Stilaxin, Xanadine, if you've heard of these. These medications more are just symptomatic medications that can reduce the muscle spasms that you feel, reduce some of the stiffness and tightness that you feel. Most of the time, they knock you out as well, so they're great to take at nighttime. So I usually give it for people who are having a lot of issues falling asleep at night because it kind of serves two purposes. It, it helps them with their pain and just kind of knocks them out so they get through that. Other medications that work are corticosteroids. So steroids, when you take them orally, are a very powerful anti-inflammatory. So if you've heard of Medrol dose packs or prednisone, those are all steroids that we give for a short period of time to again reduce inflammation. So they, they don't work in the exact same mechanism as our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but they do kind of work in the same way that they reduce the inflammation in your body. Now, you don't want to take too many steroids throughout your lifetime because they can have other sort of secondary adverse effects, such as uh, weakening your bone, altering your uh, adrenaline response, and also increase your blood sugar level temporarily. So I always tell people that cortical steroids are good for a rainy day uh, and sort of uh, in case of emergency measures. Um, you can also take Tylenol. Tramadol, these are what we call non-opioid analgesics. So they don't reduce the inflammation in the way that Advil and Lee does, but they can kind of numb you up a little bit. Other medications we give are gabapentin or nerve medication. Gabapentin actually used to be a seizure medication, but we found that it helps a lot of people with their little traffic pain or numbness, tingling, burning pain in their legs. When, in, for example, with people with you know, diabetes or peripheral neuropathy, this medication is helping a lot. So we also give it to people who have that radiculopathy or the hair pain in their legs that also seems to help with pain. Antidepressants have been shown in the research to be helpful. And then, you know, worst case scenario, opioids. I don't prescribe opioids, but uh, there are a lot of other physicians that do. Um, opioids will kind of mask the symptoms, numb you up, um, but we only really want to use them in case of emergency. Talking about physical therapy. So physical therapy, I get a lot of pushback a lot of times because I'm in an awesome sports medicine practice. And everyone that comes through is very fit, and very active, or, or at least they think they're very fit, and very active. And, I, and so you know, I get a lot of pushback when I say, hey, I think what you need is physical therapy. The common thing I get is like, well, I work out all the time, you know, and uh, you know, I, I go to the gym five times a week, I have a six pack, why would I need physical therapy? And the important thing to remember about physical therapy is that a physical therapy is not exactly the same thing as a personal trainer. They're not just there to, to make sure you look good in a swimsuit. Um, they're there to evaluate sort of, you know, where your imbalances are, where your bad habits are, what secondary muscles are you possibly ignoring. And, you know, they have doctor level degrees on figuring that stuff out. And so for a lot of people, um, you know, even if you do exercises with, the best form and, and you're following a great regimen, that doesn't mean that you're doing everything in a balanced fashion. So when you first see a physical therapist, the first thing that you're going to do is kind of evaluate what your baseline is and evaluate your you know, inefficiencies. And so from there, you set goals to kind of determine how can we balance this out and how many times do we have to do this per week to get that done? How long do you think we need to do this for? Do we need more strengthening or do we need more flexibility? Is it a combination of both? So obviously they can do exercises for you. They can also do things like uh, manipulation, massage treatment. Um, 
But I think the most important thing that they do is they they're finding the out. A lot of times that will help fix back pain. And so for me, it always starts with physical therapy. Um, I'm not a physical therapist myself, so I'm sure they can talk to you a lot more in detail about what they do specifically. But just know that for me, they, they're kind of the first first line treatment. Uh, once we've done physical therapy and medication, that's usually when we move towards injections. And so injections, um, when we talk, talk about injections, it can consist of a variety of different sort of things. And so what injections we do depend entirely on what we think the problem is. So if we feel that the problem is coming mostly from the muscle and just a, an area of muscle that has got torn or injured and just is not recovering the way we expect it to, then we can do what we call a physical injection, which is where we inject with a steroid and dummy medication right directly into the muscle. And again, remember, steroid is an anti-inflammatory. So the goal there is really to reduce the inflammation inside the muscle and make you feel better so that you can go back to doing the therapy and the other stuff. Other injections we can do are epidural steroid injections. So um, an epidural steroid injection is an injection that goes into the space around the nerves, and it actually coats the nerves in steroid and dummy medication. Again, the goal there is to reduce the inflammation around the nerves that are causing you pain down your legs and seeing if that helps. Another injection we can do, we talked about the facet joints or the joints in the back of the spine where they also can develop arthritis. So if you know people that have arthritis of their knees and hips, they'll talk about how they get injections into their knees. You can do a similar sort of thing with the facet joints in that you can numb up the area around the facet joints. And if that actually works, then that kind of localizes the pain to that facet joint. And then we can do a procedure called an ablation or a rhizotomy, where instead of putting a needle attached to a syringe with medication, we attach a needle that's connected to a machine that heats up that needle. And what that needle does when it heats up is it burns a small nerve that sits along that facet joint that relays information typically to your brain that that joint hurts. So that nerve doesn't do anything to your arms, it doesn't do anything to your legs. All that nerve typically does is it tells your brain whether or not that joint hurts. So if that nerve is severed, then there's nothing telling your brain that that joint is painful. So it doesn't change the fact that that joint is either arthritic or causing you pain, but you're still able to do everything you want to do because you don't really feel that pain. Now that nerve does grow back, so this isn't a permanent solution. But if it works for months or years, then it's a perfectly viable treatment option. Just continue to treat that with injections. It's the same thing with epidural injections. If the epidural injections work and your pain gets significantly better for months or years, then you know you can continue to treat injections. And that's totally okay. Uh, the only time that that's not okay in my book is if your symptoms include weakness. Because what we have found is that once you have weakness in your lower extremity, that may possibly not recover without some kind of intervention. But if it's just pain, numbness, or tingling, and we can get you to a point where it's not painful, it's not numb or tingling anymore, then we take that every day. Other non surgical treatment options that have been shown in the literature to help sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes, are massage. Spinal manipulation, so that's adjustments with chiropractor. Uh, acupuncture has been shown to be helpful sometimes. Yoga, Pilates, uh, aquatic therapy, traction, which is this portrait device down here. Um, breathing has been shown to be somewhat helpful at times. Um, and psychological therapies. We talked before, uh, mental health can also play a role in the experience of that. So all of these things have been studied before, and uh, according to the North American, North American Spine Society, we don't say that these things don't help at all. We just don't say that they help enough to where we make them sort of our standard of care. Whereas with things like physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, and injections, that's standard of care stuff. Meaning that they help enough people that we think it's worth trying for everybody. Other, other uh, non-surgical treatment options are dry needling. And these, this is getting into things that a lot of physical therapy offices will also, um, uh, will also have access to. 
but dry needling. This is, you know, we've all heard of acupuncture and people always feel like dry needling is the same thing. They work off of very different concepts. They both do involve small needles, but uh, with acupuncture, and I'm not an acupuncture, so I might be totally butchering this, but the, the thought process is that you have energy flowing through your body called chi, and uh, by placing needles in specific pathways of this energy, you can redirect things and, and relieve symptoms that way. So um, that's not how dry needling works. Dry needling works really by going to an area that's painful and placing needles in it to cause blood flow, increase blood flow to that area. So it can heal. Other forms of treatment are electrotherapy, which uses electric current to help stimulate um, activity in the muscles and nerves to assist with healing and also to help modulate pain. Diathermy, this just creates a heat, uh, heating current that goes through the muscle but, and also works to increase blood flow and hence increase healing. Um, this can be done through ultrasound and microwave. Low level laser therapy is sort of a similar concept in that it tries to stimulate blood flow to the soft tissues. Uh, looking on the horizon, we look into stem cells. Uh, stem cells in your body are cells in your body that have not fully matured and differentiated into specific either bone cells or cartilage cells. They are they're basically infantile cells uh, that have not really developed into anything yet. So the theory is that by injecting stem cells into an area, uh, those cells will turn into healing factors that will kind of regenerate things. And so um, in humans so far, we're, we're still researching this and there haven't been any definitive studies that show absolutely that these are incredibly beneficial, but in certain animal models, we've shown some slight benefits. So, um, the literature on this is still pending, but it's kind of something that we're looking at in the horizon as a potential benefit. And I have seen people in town that have done them, and some people say it does help. And so, um, again, it hasn't helped enough people where I definitely tell people that everyone should try it. Um, but it's, you know, it's getting there. Hopefully, as the technology improves and as the research improves, we'll find out better ways to utilize it. Uh, another injection that we can do is something called platelet rich plasma or PRP. So in our blood, we have three basic cells. We have our red blood cells, which deliver oxygen to the tissues. Uh, we have our white blood cells, which fight infection, allow healing, and then we have our platelets. And so platelets, we traditionally think about them as sort of our clotting agents. Whenever you get a cut and you get a scab, it's because the platelets have come in there and they kind of seal things up and created that scab. But uh, we've also found out through the years that the platelets actually have a lot of healing factors in themselves. And so what we do with PRP injections is we draw the blood and then we spin it down so that we isolate just the platelets. So once we've isolated just those platelets, we get this hyper-concentrated serum that just has a lot of healing factors. And so the theory there is that if we inject that into an area that is not able to heal very well or it's degenerated, that that will that that injection of PRP will help with healing. Again, same concept with the stem cell. On paper, it sounds like it should be this miracle cure, but in practice, for whatever reason, it's still kind of one of those things where it helps some, doesn't help a lot of others. So it's, it's worth trying if you're trying to avoid all surgical treatments and you try everything else, but it hasn't, we haven't found that it's helped enough people that I recommend that. But hopefully in time, we kind of find a good use for it. So that kind of concludes the discussion on non-surgical treatment options. So now we're going to move to what do we do whenever we have a problem in there that we can correct and it's not getting better with physical therapy, medications, injections, and other sort of treatment modalities. So when I discuss surgery, um, you know, my goals here are to either remove pressure off the nerves, because again, the most common reason why I'm operating on people is because their anatomy has been altered and changed. And as we discussed earlier, because the nerves are surrounded and encased in the bone and the disc, if you have any alterations to your anatomy, then you're likely going to be pushing or squeezing on nerves. So part of my goal there is to take pressure off of nerves and kind of restore normal alignment to the spine. Um, we also look to eliminate any sort of abnormal motion. So specifically, this is discussing spondylolisthesis or that slipping spine issue. 
if your pain is generated from the spine moving abnormally, then we need to stop that movement. So that's another goal of surgery. When you really simplify and break down surgery in the spine, we really kind of break down surgery into two things. We really only can do two things in the spine. We can either decompress the nerves or we can fuse the spine. So again, we talked about how whenever you have any alteration in the anatomy, the nerves can get pushed or squeezed. So when we say decompression, what we're meaning is that we're taking pressure off the nerves. Whether that means removing bone or whether that means realigning the spine, that's all what we call decompression. Fusion is where we're stopping normal motion across the spine. So it's spondylolisthesis, where the bone is moving back and forth. When we want to stop that from moving back and forth, we do something called a fusion. So fusion entails creating a biologically favorable environment to stop to cause bone to grow in between two areas that used to be. So you have one area here, one area down here. They are used to moving back and forth. We do something so that those bones grow together to make one solid block of bone. That's the simplest way of, of, of looking at spine fusion. So in addition to kind of stopping abnormal motion, we can also realign the spine by fusing the spine. So this is sort of a, a, this is a laminectomy. This is, a diagram. this is a diagram of laminectomy. So this is kind of the most basic way we decompress the spine. So in this photo, what you see here is those are your nerves sitting in here. And you can see that this pouch is not the normal state that we you know, normally see with it being circulated. And so here, what we've done is this right here was the lambda, if you remember from the very beginning. We've taken out the lambda here. So I always kind of describe it as like taking the roof off the house. And so once you take the roof off the house, all the contents inside the house have more room to breathe. So in the same way here, we take the roof off the spine and now these nerves have all the room to breathe. So in this person, if they were having a lot of leg pain or back pain related to this, now that pain is gone because the nerves have more room space. So this is called a laminectomy. This down here is called a laminotomy. And in this area, this person's only having some focal tightness right in this area here. So we just take off a little bit of the bone back here to get this space on uh, this nerve more room on this side. So this is a laminotomy here. So all we've done is just taken out this much bone. Whereas with a laminectomy, we've taken out basically all of it from here to here. So a discectomy is, so ectomy means removal. So a discectomy is a removal of this. So most of the time when we do micro discectomies, what that is doing is that's taking out a small piece of disc. So typically that means a disc herniation has occurred. And so what I'm doing is I'm just taking out a small piece of disc, that jelly that's come out of the donut, I'm removing it. So usually the way that procedure works is I have to do a laminotomy. So I'm having to take away a little bit of bone so I can get down to that disc. And once I get down to that disc, I find that loose piece of jelly and I take that off. So that's a micro discectomy. A total complete discectomy is when we actually take out the entire disc. So sometimes it's needed that we have to take out the entire disc. If you do that, you've now created a new problem in that the spine is now unstable because it's lost that big supporting structure in the front. So whenever you take out the entire disc, you have to accompany that by stabilizing the spine somehow. And the way we stabilize the spine is with fusion. And so again, a fusion in the simplest sense is taking two areas that used to move and turning them into one solid block that won't move anymore. And so this is something called a posterior lateral fusion. So what we've done here is we put some bone graft that fits between these two tabs of the bone right here. And over time, the bone kind of grows between here and prevents the spine from moving anymore. Okay? And so, you know, that process can take about three to six months to really solidify. So we need something to kind of hold the spine in place because to stop it from moving too much. Otherwise, if the spine moves too much, then the bone will not be allowed to heal there. So we usually put in screws and rods to hold the spine in place. So these act more as internal braces as the bone kind of grows in between here. After about a year or so, the screws and the rods really serve no function anymore. The bone is healed, and so the, the, the spine is not really moving. So the, the, the screws and rods really just become placeholders. Um, now, they're usually placed with the intention of staying in there, so you don't have to take them out. But if they do cause symptoms for whatever reason, you can't take out those screws and rods after about a year. 
So this is what we call a posterior lateral fusion. This was the old way that we used to do a lot of our fusion. Nowadays, we're doing more of what we call inner body fusions. So an inner body fusion involves removing the disc or doing a complete discectomy and then placing a bone graft cage in between these bones here. And the advantage is to doing an inner body fusion is that it allows us a lot more surface area to work with. And therefore, there's a lot more surface area for the bone to fuse to. So we see a lot better fusion rates with doing inner body fusions. And the other really nice thing with doing inner body fusions is it allows us to realign the spine if there's any changes to the anatomy. So you can imagine that someone who is having problems because their disc has worn down or degenerated significantly, we can put in a bone graft cage that is bigger than the disc we took out. So if they had any sort of other anatomy problems related to their anatomy changing because of their degenerative changes, we can now restore sort of their normal alignment and normal anatomy by doing an inner body fusion. The most common sort of anatomical problem I'm trying to fix is, fix is that as these discs degenerate, this right here is your framing where the nerves come out of. So you can imagine that as this space gets smaller and smaller, this space also gets smaller and smaller. So when we do this inner body fusion, we can actually jack open this disc space here and also jack open the space for the nerve in here. That's kind of the most common reason why I'm using these inner body fusions. Now, another sort of hot word that everyone talks about in spine surgery is minimally invasive spine surgery. So what is minimally invasive spine surgery? Well, it's 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 right there in the game. It's spine surgery that's not as invasive. But what does it mean? So minimally invasive spine surgery is any sort of surgical procedure in the spine where we are trying to make smaller incisions, we're trying to see less of the spine, and we're trying to use retractors and cameras and tubes and techniques to minimize how much of a soft tissue dissection we have to do. In traditional spine surgery, if you want to fix something, you have to look at everything. And so we used to have to do sort of large um, midline incisions, and then underneath there, we have to kind of get through all that muscle and look at all the bone and spread things out in order to do things like fusions or laminectomies. But nowadays, with the use of tubes and cameras and x-rays, um, instead of having to really get down here and kind of move inside all this muscle, we can use a tube just to go to this area in here. And so what that's going to do is that's going to cause you to have um, less blood loss, uh, which will result in less complications there after surgery. Because the dissection is a lot smaller, it will be less painful, so that can reduce your hospitalization time and also reduce your recovery time. Um, and then obviously you have a smaller incision. So um, in this picture here, this is someone that had a uh, microdiscectomy. That incision is about the size of a dime. Uh, and so they, this can be a very sort of helpful technique to get people uh, feeling better, quicker, with less pain, less hospitalization, and less risk. And so again, the tools that we use in minimally invasive spine surgery are tubes or special retractors. Um, X-ray, or what we call fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is live, uh, real-time X-ray um, that we can use to kind of guide our instruments to where we need to, so we don't need to actually open things up to see them. We can actually use X-ray to know where we're at. Um, navigation, robotic arms, lasers, cameras, and we're going to talk about all this stuff here really quickly. So navigated spine surgery. So whenever we talk about instrumenting the spine or putting screws and rods. Traditionally, we have to, again, make a big incision, look at the bony landmarks, and then kind of feel our way down to the appropriate areas for those screws and pages to go. Nowadays, we can use something called navigation. In navigation, what we do is we first start by doing a CT scan when you're in the operating room. Once we've done that CT scan, we have software that can link that CT scan to a marker on your body that allows us then to use what we call navigated tools that can show us in real time where we're at relative to the CT scan and subsequently your body. So I can look, when I do navigated spine cases, I can place a screw inside, um, inside the bone uh, through a very small incision 
And I can know exactly where I'm going with that screw by looking at a screen that shows me, okay, this is exactly where I am in the boat and tell me, am I in a safe area? Am I heading toward a dangerous area? Um, and just gives us a lot more peace of mind, number one, but also it ensures that we're putting things exactly where they're supposed to be. Robotic spine surgery is kind of the next stage of that. So um, well, the way robotic spine surgery works is in the exact same way with the CT scan and navigated instrument, except that then takes it a further step by linking further to a robotic arm that kind of holds my instruments exactly where I need them to go. And then I'm pushing them through myself. So there's still that sort of tactile feel that I have, but everything is lined up by the robotic arm. Laser spine surgery. Um, laser spine surgery is it's, it's really just using anything that heats up really um heats up to a very high temperature. Uh, but they can sometimes use this to reduce sort of the size of disc herniation. Um, they also we also uh, you know I've also seen people call uh, some of our normal instruments lasers. So this is kind of a I don't want to call it a misnomer, but I think the word laser spine surgery is a bit overused and, and, and really not something that we see much in our day-to-day -day practice. Endoscopic spine surgery is sort of another development of uh, improving field in medicine that uh, as our technology is improving, this is becoming a very useful tool. So uh, again, talking about how minimally invasive surgery uses special tools and instruments to get down to the spine without us having to do a lot of soft tissue dissection. We can use cameras to also make small incisions to get down to the spine. And then we can look at a video screen that kind of shows us what we're looking at. And so when we do endoscopic spine surgery, um, what I'm seeing on the screen, yes, so on a screen, we're looking at inside the spine here and what we're looking at in here, this is where the disc space would be. So if there was a disc herniation, it's already kind of um, getting cleared out now, but the disc would be here and you would be able to see the disc herniation on the screen. And again, you're doing this through a whole pole incision uh, and this allows us to kind of know exactly what we're doing without having to make a large incision. Um, looking at sort of the diagram of it, um, traditionally with normal surgery, we're having to make sort of these larger incisions to kind of get down there. But when we're using cameras, we're just using a small hole like that. So the benefits of um, endoscopic spine surgery, again, is you get to avoid any large incisions and muscle dissection, which results in less pain, reduced blood loss, quicker recovery time, um, you have to take out less bone, so you're really preserving a lot of your normal anatomy. Um, and, you know, moving on in the future, a lot of people are now are starting to actually do fusions of the spine through cameras, which is amazing. Um, you know, that technology is really starting to accelerate. So I think in another five, 10 years time, this is how people are going to be doing all of these sort of fusions. Uh, other treatment options are disc replacement. So a lumbar disc replacement, instead of um, putting in bone graft cages that could be in the second, uh, you can put in these metal and plastic components that still allow the normal motion in your spine. Um, this is, you know, helpful for people who really have isolated disc related pain. Uh, that's fairly rare to have in spine surgery. But in those rare cases where you do have it, this is a good option to kind of be able to preserve motion. But the big problem with when we fuse the spine is that once you start fusing the spine, the levels above and below the fusion will start seeing more pressure because you've kind of changed the mechanics of the spine. So theoretically, doing a disc replacement takes off that load on the level above and below the you know where you've operated on. That hopefully you don't have additional issues with the level of blood below the fusion generated by the gout. Other surgical treatment options, and this is one that's also done by pain management physicians, but there are inner, so called interspinous spacers. So, this is the placement of a device that sits basically in between the spine, and it doesn't fuse the spine, but what it effectively does is it restricts the motion in your spine. 
So what we see in people with spinal stenosis or tightness around the nerves in the uh, central area right here is that when they lean forward, they're feeling a lot better because their spine kind of opens up more. But when they lean backwards, it's more painful because you kind of close in on this um, on the canal a bit. And so with these spaces, it prevents you from really leaning back all the way and closing off that space. So this is a good sort of, uh, well, this is a non-fusion device um, that can sometimes help people temporarily. Uh, another um, thing that we did not really discuss much about are compression fractures. Um, so people with osteoporosis or weak bone, sometimes you can develop what we call compression fractures, which is where the bone collapses in on itself because it's weak. So another, so sometimes the, what, what is needed for that to stop progressing is we inject some cement into the bone that kind of fills in the soft area, uh, and then that prevents the bone from moving around. Um, that's another sort of minimally invasive procedure that we can do as an outpatient where we use x-ray to guide um, a cannula or basically a ball, big straw into the bone and into the vertebral body. And then from there, we can place a balloon in there that we then open up to create a space for the cement to go in there. Um, and then again, once the cement hardens, that bone should no longer be moving or it should hopefully not be as compressed. So the risk of spine surgery, most of it's the same risk as any surgery that you have. So pain, bleeding, infection, um, ongoing pain, again, back pain and spine pain in general is very complex. So there is always potential that you have problems in other areas. Um, nerve injury, uh, DVTs, blood clots, need for more surgery, um, and then you have the risks of anesthesia. Postoperatively, for almost every case we do, my goal is to get you up and out of bed as soon as possible. If we can get you out and walking on day zero of surgery, then I'm very happy with that. So, you know, a big part of recovery from spine surgery entails being up, being moving. There is usually no bed rest, you know, wanted. Um, so, you know, hospital stay will obviously depend depending on what procedure one has done. So larger cases obviously will likely have a longer, longer hospital stay, but there are plenty of procedures we do that are stay day in, stay day out. Um, usually the restrictions that we have are no heavy bending, no heavy lifting or twisting for the first six weeks. And then physical therapy usually for me starts at two weeks um, and then carries out for the next few months until you are essentially doing everything you want to do. Most operatively, in order to help with wound care, we haven't talked about smoking. And then also diabetes has been associated with increased risk. So um, a good reason to not do spine surgery is uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and so I usually say that it takes up to a year to, until you can finally say that, hey, you know, what I have after surgery is what I've got. For most people, recovery is somewhere between three to six months. So the best treatment for the spine is obviously preventative treatment. Right. So you want to make sure that you have the appropriate ergonomics. So lifting with your legs, making sure you're having good posture, um, you know, um, not lifting more than you should be, um, make sure your furniture equipment set at home is in a good position. Um, uh, lifting techniques. Uh, it's technically seen that the best position to sleep in, because I always get this question, is, is technically to lie on your back on a semi-firm mattress. That's kind of the um, the global advice that we give, but people are understandably different, and some people can't sleep, you know, on their backs. They think of side sleepers, they sleep facing down. That's okay, um, you know, if that's what you have to do to get some sleep, it's probably more important to sleep. But if you're able to lay on your back, and you're able to tolerate it on some mattress, technically that's, that's supposed to be the best for your back. And then obviously having a proper diet, um, doing good exercise, uh, make sure you're maintaining your weight, uh, not smoking, uh, not getting diabetes, those things are very good. Um, and so in conclusion, again, low back pain is a very common issue, so you're not alone if you have it. Uh, remember that 95% of the time you will not need surgery or any sort of invasive treatment to fix it. Um, you know, the, the causes of back pain are varied and are multifactorial. So it's not uh, uncommon to need a little bit of help with that. 
And so, you know, physical therapy, again, medication, injections are all great conservative treatment options to help with that. And if needed, um, surgery is a good option um, for the right people. And nowadays, we can do that minimally invasively. So that's that's all. That's my whole talk. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to any uh, questions. Sit and turn the back. Um, is the lumbar pillow sleeping on one? Is that ever helpful? Uh, so uh, is it a pillow that you lie directly on your back, or it's, it's a lumbar? It's not really a pillow. It's just kind of a triangular shape. Like a wedge or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Get more support to your lumbar. You know, it's not necessary, but a lot of people do find that sort of sleeping in that position when your legs are kind of slightly elevated uh, does feel better. Um, why that is probably is kind of more dependent on your anatomy specifically, um, but it is something that I, I hear a lot of people have, you know, say that that's the only way they can sleep in life. Yeah. So it can also be helpful. Uh, osteoporosis. If you have a patient coming in with back pain with osteoporosis, how do you address that? So first and foremost, what I want to look for are any of those compression fractures that, that we talk about. Because really, if you're going to have back pain because of osteoporosis, the most likely cause of that, or the one that you should be seeing a physician for, is because of um, compression fracture. So first and foremost, I'm looking for a compression fracture. So I'm getting an x-ray. Is it's inconclusive on an x ray that I'm getting an MRI. You know, the thing with osteoporosis and compression fractures is a lot of times people don't know they have it. Uh, they, they'll just kind of tell me that, oh, yeah, a few years ago, I had a little bit of back ache it, for a couple of weeks and they got better and better and better and now it's fine. And then we get an x ray and it turns out, oh, yeah, yeah, it's not been back that whole time. Um, and so, you know, the thing about the compression fractures is that the vast majority of them do eventually settle out and, and heal on their own. So, most of the time, you don't need anything for compression fracture. So, um, so I would just talk a lot about specifics of compression fractures. But normally, when someone first comes in with compression fracture, they suspect it. I get an X-ray, and if it's very obvious that oh yes, you did have a compression fracture, my first line treatment is to give you a brace and then just wait and see. You know, if after a couple of weeks you're you're doing better and you're starting to heal, then I say, hey, I think this could be okay without surgery. Let's you know go and you know do physical therapy, take some medications, continue to place. We'll see you back in six weeks. Um, if at the two week mark you're still having just a lot of pain, you're still very restricting your mobility. Usually, what I do then is I get an MRI to kind of look for okay, is this really an acute compression fracture? Is this a new one, or what am I? Or is what I see on the X-ray an old compression fracture? Uh, are there other levels that are involved? And from there, you know, after the MRI, if you're still in a lot of pain, then we can talk about that psychoplasty. But if you feel like you're getting better, then we continue to wait and wait watch. After about six to eight weeks, if you were, you know, we were treating this down operatively, you were getting better, but then you kind of plateaued out. Now you just kind of have this sort of stable level of pain that's just inhibiting you from doing everything you want to do. I would get an MRI at that point, see if there's still, you know, signal inside the bone to show that that bone has not healed yet. And there still is you know, inflammation inside the bone that tells me it has to go. And so then we can talk about doing that hypoplastic procedure at that time. So that's kind of my own opinion. Is this slideshow available to the public? So not the slideshow, but the talk will be on at um, LT Senior Services, the okay. website. Sure. So thanks for asking that. So now I don't have to remember to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Would you repeat it though? Oh, yeah. LT Senior Services. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. I wanted to share my history. I developed an episode of pain here in the anterior part of my leg, very intense. And, uh, and when I went to, to have it checked, they find out that I have significant amount of nerve in the spinal cord. And there were some disc degeneration in between lumbar three and four, lumbar four and five. So they had the surgery and the, the pain disappeared. But the only thing that I'm still suffering is some weakness and pain in my lumbar spine here. So, and the, I don't know how to get rid of this. <laughs> okay, yeah, 
so um, again, you know, that came up with so many different things. So, um, you know, if they did a procedure where all they did was a laminectomy, which is where they opened up space for the nerves, that doesn't have anything to do with the joints. It doesn't have anything to do with the discs. It doesn't change anything to your muscles. So, you know, again, when we do spine surgery, uh, it only addresses specific issues. And so if you're having issues related to those other things that they did with us with spine surgery, then we would kind of expect that you might still have some issues with those other areas. So I thought an uncommon story. Um, and a lot of times what we're looking to treat is kind of the worst thing, because, you know, the hope is that you treat the worst that's really debilitating, and then the rest of it gets better as you are, you know, in less pain, you do more physical therapy, have strength and things. So it kind of so the, the why of all of that kind of just depends on, you know, what else is going on inside the back. Having a course of physical therapy, you know, let's see what happens. That's probably the right move to start with, you know, and then if you're, again, if it kind of continues to persist, uh, then you kind of go through the rest of the treatments we talked about with injections, and then based off of what's going on, you know, if you need another procedure to grab something else, then that might be the next step. You so, touched on stem cell uh, therapies, but didn't seem didn't seem to endorse them that much. Can you talk more about that? Because I know there's companies out there that are doing that, and, and it might not be specific to spine, you know, but they're using it for other things, graft versus host disease, yeah. and cardiac stuff. And so I just wanted to get a little more thought about that because that seems like it'd be very effective if it does work. Yeah. Uh, so. I don't want to put on the record necessarily, but you know, there's a reason why stem cells and stuff like that are only approved by insurance or not paid for by insurances when it comes to the spine. And, and a lot of times, the indications that have the reason for that happening is because the literature and the research hasn't really shown that it's benefited enough people for it to be approved by insurance. So that's kind of how the insurance companies and Medicare work. You know, uh, we practice what we call evidence based medicine. And so everything that we do or anything that we're approved to do and get paid for by insurance comes to Medicare, we're paid to do it um, or we're allowed to be paid to do it because it's been shown in the research to be very helpful. And so it becomes standard of care. Stem cell is one of those things where I'm not saying that it will never be part of that sort of standard of care, but there's just not enough research out there that has shown that it's been helpful enough to make it standard of care. So when I did my own sort of research review of, of stem cells, what I found was that you know, there were some good results in, in, in some cows and some dog studies, but when it comes to human studies, it sort of shows a, a all it really shows is it's not inferiority. So it, it's not more helpful than sort of traditional treatment with therapy, medication, different methods. So it doesn't mean it doesn't help. It just means that it doesn't help enough for us to say, oh yes, everyone should try this. So, you know, in my mind, again, I think that it's something that on paper sounds fantastic, but in practice, for whatever reason, it really, it, it doesn't work as well as it should. And we don't know if maybe just the technique that we're using it is not right, or maybe just simply we don't understand the physiology well enough yet as scientists and doctors. Um, but there's a lot of those sort of things in medicine where on paper, it, it seems to make a ton of sense, but then for whatever reason, it, it just doesn't. And so that's kind of one of those things. And I think it, it owes a lot of it to the fact that, again, spine pain is very complex, you know? And so uh, if you're gonna do stem cells, you're assuming that your spine pain is coming from one area. Because you can't inject stem cells into everywhere. You have to inject into one area. So yeah, if your pain is coming from that area and the stem cell works, then, then that's great. But your pain can be coming from so many different locations, from different things, factors, and stem cells would have nothing to do with that. So, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. I think we can do one more question. I just wanted to ask about specifically prevention of spondylolisthesis. It seems like uh, one of your main indicators for surgery specifically is uh, a change in the anatomy of the spine and spondylolisthesis. I mean, right. so what would you recommend as prevention for specifically that? Or what are the causes that we might be able to address to prevent right. spondylolisthesis? So yes, yeah, so spinal anesthesia again is abnormal movement back and forth that the spine that we talked about. Uh, a lot of times, the most common reason you see that is there's a genetic change in the joint, then the spine starts flipping back and forth. Other reasons why you can have it is you can have 
general defects in the spine where the front and the back of the spine just never form properly. And that's what allows the spine to slip back and forth. In terms of preventing things from getting worse, you know, that, that really is our goal, of course, because we can't reverse it, not without surgery. And so, uh, again, the goal is prevention, like you say. And so, for me, I always kind of say that it, it starts with physical therapy, you know, making sure that uh, you have someone who's kind of watching how you bend, how you lift, how you carry things, how you stand, making sure that it's the most efficient way to do it so you're not putting some excess strain. Uh, because if the spinal fluid thesis is related to general changes, we know we can't reverse the generation. But, you know, if we do physical therapy, if we have proper diet, exercise, you know, maintain your weight, and not, you know, get obese and stuff like that, then that should slow things down a bit. It still may end up progressing. Um, but if we can slow it down enough um, to, you know, to where it won't be a problem 300 years from now, then that, that's really our goal, you know. But it starts for me with physical therapy, okay? So physical therapy, um, certain activities. We hate telling people who are all young like yourselves that, like, you know, you can't do the things you want to do. But there are certain activities that just at the end of the day, biomechanically, they're, they're just rougher on your back. So squats, deadlifts, those kinds of activities. You can do them with the perfect technique, but you can't change the biomechanical effect that that puts the most axial load on the spine. And therefore, if you have degenerative issues or spinal thesis, that's going to accelerate sort of how quickly that goes. So there is some form of activity modification too. Right? But in terms of bracing, no, not so much. You know, um, no, no real medications to take. It's, it's really just physical therapy, changing your core, modifying your activities. And I would say that's the best we can do. Thank you. 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 Thank you.